As the Titanic gracefully sails across the icy waters of the North Atlantic, anticipation fills the air. Passengers revel in the luxury and grandeur of the ship, each with their own dreams and aspirations for the journey ahead. Meanwhile, deep within the heart of the vessel, the crew diligently tends to their duties, ensuing the smooth operation of this marvel of engineering. But beneath the surface of this idyllic scene lies a brewing sense of foreboding. Unbeknownst to those on board, the Titanic hurtled towards its fatal encounter with destiny, a collision with an iceberg that will forever alter the course of history. As we pick up the narrative before the iceberg's collision, we delve into the bustling life on board the ship, from the lavish restaurants and dining rooms to the bustling engine rooms, we witness the intricate tapestry of human experiences that defy this legendary voyage. Join us as we journey deeper into the heart of the Titanic, exploring the untold stories of those who walked its decks and the events that led to that fateful night of April 14, 1912. It is now April 14, 1912. Titanic was steaming through a region known for ice. The ship was actually reaching near top speed. The meth the time is now 11 o'clock p.m. Ship's time. By now, passengers of the Titanic are now mostly asleep on board, but a few of the passengers actually are drinking coffee or hot tea in the Alicardi restaurant. And some are actually, you know, straggling around. Up high in the crow's nest are Frederick Fleet and Reginald Lee, both crew members of the RMS Titanic. An hour ago, they both relieved lookouts George Simons and Archie Jewell, both gave the men specific instructions to look out for ice. The weather is calm, cold as the temperature dropped to 31 degrees. The sea is flat, calm, starry night with no moon and a slight haze in front. For those that don't know what a crow's nest is, a crow's nest is a shelter or a platform fixed near the top of a mast of a vessel as a place for a lookout to stand. Keep in mind this is pre-radar at the time frame. Now, the haze is actually created by a cold water mirage. This is likely what happened when there's cold air air below warmer air, and this type can make objects look like they're floating up in the sky and causing light paths in between the boundary of the two to be bent dramatically, distorting how an object appears. Now, would binoculars actually work in this case whatsoever? Well, unfortunately, no. As we all know, and we actually discussed this earlier in the earlier part of this documentary, was this, you had to keep this in mind, though. There was a reshuffle of bridge officers on the RMS Titanic prior to the maiden voyage, to which David Blair, who was actually the original second officer on board the Titanic, when Captain Smith actually brought on Chief Officer Henry Wilde from the RMS Olympic, this actually bumped David Blair off the roster, and therefore he left the ship. So Blair actually took the key that was actually meant for a locker to which the binoculars were actually stored in. Now, whether with these binoculars are useful or not, it wouldn't matter anyway whatsoever. Because if you're going to look through out there in the Atlantic Ocean, all you're going to see is total darkness. Now, they could be useful if it was light outside, but since it's at night, all you're going to see is very total darkness whatsoever. Then, at 11.39pm, Frederick Fleet and Reginald Lee spotted a dark mass of ice directly in their way, and when it came closer, it horrified them and realized it was an iceberg. Fleet rang the bell three times. Fuck me! Is there anyone there? Yes, what do you see? Iceberg, right ahead! Thank you. First Officer William Murdoch was on duty that night and already commanded the helmsman, Robert Hickens, to turn hard to starboard, which basically means turn the ship to port whatsoever. He would throw the reciprocating engines in reverse but the forward momentum of the ship actually still carried the Titanic forward. Now, if you think about this, it looked like they were going to avoid a huge head-on collision. Down in the boiler in the engine rooms, men were scrambling to drop the steam pressure as a red light is emitted in boiler room number 6, signalizing to stop. Upon seeing this, Frederick Fleet ordered the men to shut off airflow to the boilers, and now the Titanic is adrift with the reversing engines. However, with very effort, it looked like Titanic might miss a head-on collision, but unfortunately, the danger part of the iceberg is not up at the top, it's mostly under the water. 10% you can actually see, but the 90% you cannot. Then the inevitable happened. At 11.40pm, the Titanic strikes the iceberg. As the Titanic bumped along, the seams start buckling and the rivets were popped, allowing in seawater from the outside. The worst damage came in boiler room number 6 as water poured into the boiler room and a hard pour order is also given out to clear the ship's propellers from getting damaged by the iceberg. 
From the bridge, William Murdoch already turned the switch on to close off the watertight compartment doors, sealing off the water inside the ship, and right away, Captain Smith is already up on the bridge as he felt the collision. And he immediately asked what happened, as Murdoch stated it was an iceberg. Now, depending on where you're at on the ship whatsoever, if you're anywhere within the bow section up here, you would definitely feel something, especially if you're a fireman off-duty or basically a third-class passenger. You would definitely feel that rumble up here. But if you actually happen to be somewhere back here, it's going to sound like basically a freight train pulling into the station. So basically all you're going to do is basically feel some slight shaking whatsoever. Jack Thayer noted this when he, he saw his glass of water shaking as he was asleep in his room. The rest who were actually still awake would actually notice, you know, the chandeliers are shaking. The damage of the iceberg actually extended from the four-peak tank, which is right up here, up front, all the way aft to the first funnel. Puncturing a small gash in the four coal bunker for boiler room number five. So crew and surviving third-class passengers who bunked in the forward areas of the Titanic did definitely felt something like a violent crash whatsoever. Captain Smith ordered the engines to stop, so it would be the last time the Titanic engines would ever operate on board the ship. The most notable so sound throughout the voyage is the heartbeat of the reciprocating engines working. Once that is stopped, passengers actually took notice of this unusual silence and asked what happened. Lars Beasley, who is a second-class passenger and later author of The Loss of the SS Titanic, happened to notice the silence in his book, and said that is, and that is was the first hint of anything out of the ordinary had happened. From where the Titanic has stopped is true north northwest, 400 miles off the southern coast of Newfoundland, and it's going to be that way for eternity. Immediately afterwards, safety valves were actually open to relieve the steam pressure of the Titanic was actually building up inside. So you have to remember, Titanic was running on full, nearly full pressure of steam and it would have continued and therefore caused a boiler explosion. So, what do you do with this steam? You basically have one pipe here and another one right here. And once this steam is actually built up so built up to the point to where it has to go out through the safety valves, somebody would have to flip the safety valve and basically let all that steam out. The steam was actually venting out so loud that it was actually very hard to communicate with one another on the boat deck. So it's going to be a lot of noise whatsoever. So this basically went on until the steam actually stopped. And this basically, the steam actually did stop when the ti Titanic officers had to lower passengers off into the boats whatsoever. But we're going to get to that in the next part whatsoever. And in this animation by Titanic Honor and Glory, you can hear the steam venting out, and for animation's sake, it's not as loud, but if you were anywhere on the boat deck, it would be deafening loud. Think of it as a tea kettle on a hot stove with water and tea in it. Crew members reported that the uh, noise was deafening. Fourth Officer Boxhall started his own investigation as he descended down. He received a report from a carpenter saying that the four-peak hatch was blown off and the number one tarpaulin is ballooning up. Another report also came in from a mail clerk saying that the mail room is filling up and we went to see as bags of mail were floating around. It appeared the Titanic's in trouble. Now you're thinking to yourself, what is the four-peak tank? Well, the four-peak tank is actually the very first front compartment up here. But however, that compartment is actually below it. So basically that's a watertight area, but... The top part of that area is basically not sealed. And then, of course, you got the, the three forward compartments, which is up here where my fingers are, respectively. You also have boiler room number six, which is right here where my ring finger is. And also, there's a tiny gash into coal bunker number five, the four post one. However, the Titanic can survive any collision with the first four watertight compartments breach or two back here or any two up here. But how, unfortunately, the iceberg opened up the seams from the four-peak tank to aft of the first funnel. And Titanic is basically doomed. And this ship cannot stay afloat with the first five compartments breached. Five compartments is basically, let's put it that, a very unsurvivable condition. As the Titanic collides with the unforgiving force of the iceberg, 
The reverberations of the impact echo throughout the ship. Panic ensues as passengers and crew alike grapple with the sudden realization of the impending danger. In the blink of an eye, the grandeur of the Titanic gives way to chaos and uncertainty. As the night unfolds and the Titanic begins its descent into the icy depths of the North Atlantic, the true magnitude of the tragedy becomes apparent. Amidst the chaos, act of heroism, and selflessness emerge as individuals strive to save themselves and others from the icy embrace of the sea. As we transition to April 15, 1912, the sinking of the Titanic is underway in full force. We find ourselves amidst a scene of unimaginable despair and heartbreak. As the ship, once unsinkable ship, succumbs to the relentless force of the nature, join us as we bear witness to the harrowing events of the fateful night, honoring the courage and resilience of those who face the ultimate test of survival aboard the Titanic.